how do you get beyond the confusion around context and tasks so that you can use them powerfully? So in case you haven't met me before or I haven't met you, my name is Francis Wade and I'm here at Two Time Labs and Schedule You. And today we're going to be digging into that question, which is one that's perplexing many folks who, some of them have used GTD, others have, are using tasks without knowing it, others have heard about the idea, sorry, tags without knowing it, others have heard the idea, and they are confused. They are confused because there's a lot of different opinions flying around. And today we'll sort them out. Maybe not every single one, but many of them. But before I go much further, I want to make sure that your fingers are working and that you're hearing me clearly. Could you put a comment in the chat? Oh, it's already started. Hi, Janice. How are you? Just put a comment in the chat because this is going to be an interactive session all the way throughout. Hi, Judy. Hey, Brett. All the way from Georgia. Great. Linda, okay, hi, hi, Judy, hi, hi, Brad, hey, 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 great, okay, so I'm just going to start sharing my screen right away, and we can dive into the meat of the matter, sharing my screen, there we go, should swap over in just a moment, okay, there we go, great, and here's a question I just asked. And um, just before we go any further, I just want to make sure that you know that there is something big coming up in which questions like the one that we're asking are going to be answered. Questions around all matters related to task management and time blocking. And that's going to be the summit that's coming up in March. You can register right now. Matter of fact, we're opening registration as we speak. Yes. <laughs> you could. I also want to let you know about one of our speakers having an event next week. It may be well known to you. So this is not a free set free session. This is actually a paid paid um, conference that he's having. And uh, I have the URL on the screen, and I'm going to invite you to consider taking it. The lineup is an awesome one, and it's next week, Tuesday. So there's not much time ahead. Great. So our agenda for tonight, we're going to spend about an hour here in what's called presentation mode. And we'll be discussing, going back and forth, uh, regarding the questions I'll be asking, the issues I'll be tackling. We'll take a break for about five minutes to do a technical refresh, which is required by Remo, which basically means I have to close the screen, open it back up, and all you have to do is just refresh, hit refresh a couple of times, and come back in. Then we'll answer some questions in a Q&A, and then we'll go into a networking session at now, we may get there a little earlier, a little later, we shall see. But let's start with an assumption that you were exposed to contexts for the first time when you read or heard of GTD. And I'm talking, tonight I'll focus on the 2001 version, which is the one I have to have. And that was the first time you heard about this idea of context. And maybe you even applied them and you found a huge boost from their application because it worked. However, perhaps like many other people, you know that the context that you used back in 2001 don't really quite work with the way you had first envisioned, had first used them. As you go back and try to use at home or at computer, they no longer fit the world that you're living in. Some things have changed, but you're not alone, thankfully. There's lots of places on the, the internet that I've seen, lots of forums. People don't really understand or know why context has stopped working. Okay, there's a question here I'm just going to answer. Hi, Paul. Good to hear from you. Um, Paul, if you're on a smartphone or a laptop, it's better to be on a laptop. If you're on a smartphone, better to be on an iOS phone. If you're not on an iOS phone, restart your browser and just do a complete. Either re oh, you're on a Windows PC. Okay, close down all other applications and all other tabs if you're on a Windows PC. And it works better on, things work better on Chrome. Hi, Dave. David, how are you? Dr. Drake. Well, everyone is saying they're having the same problems. Wow. Lots of static. Hmm.
wrong microphone. How's that? <laughs> Technology. Aha! <laughs> it's all, it was all on my side. <laughs> I had the wrong microphone going. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> so people have been asking these questions, and I've been doing a few years of research into why people are asking these questions and the nature of them. Answers that they've been getting. And I hate to say have been they've not been definitive, they've not been research based. But here are some of the answers that that I've heard when people ask, what should I do about context? It's not it's not working for me. And I want you to actually type in the chat A, B, C, or D for something else. A, I stopped using them long ago. So I want to hear, are you do you fall into B? B, I came from my own thing. Lots of Bs. Okay, three, four, yeah, okay, C. I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes I use them, sometimes I don't. I don't know why. Or other, other D. If there are any others, if you could tell us what you're doing instead of A, B, or C, I'd love to hear because I, I could only think of A, B, or C as a possible response so that we can know. Uh, what it is that you're doing. I use context in my system. Okay. Oh, you, is that, that, that may be your maybe your own thing. Okay, great. Yeah, as as described. But the real question that people want to know, even though, even when they've gotten a way that works for them, is does my path make sense? And. Are there some hidden benefits if I'm not using them the way I was taught or I learned to use them in getting things done by David Allen? If I'm not using them that way, the way he said, are there some hidden benefits I'm losing? And if I'm not doing it, if I'm not using them at all, are there benefits? And if I'm doing my own thing, are there benefits that I'm losing? In other words, I'm kind of out here doing my own thing, but how do I even validate or know that it's the best thing for me? Some people ask the question, is it the right thing? And what they're trying to find out is, is there a right, is there a right answer? Tonight we'll answer that question. So the average response that folks make to these answers, which are all over the place, is to remain perplexed. And I think that's where most folks are with respect to knowing what the right answer should be. Just living in hope that one day it'll all work out. They'll just keep going and going because life goes on anyway. They need to manage their tasks. And even though they're not confident about the way they're managing their tasks, they'll at least have some forward momentum. And then there are some in response to the questions and the queries and the, 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 the ineffectiveness of their own approach. They basically treat DTD, they, they actually call it the canonical DTD, which is the way David Allen said it. And what they mean by that is a bit like the Constitution. What did the framer say and what did he intend? And if he said anything since then, no. What's in the original book? A bit like the King James Version. So those are three different approaches that I've seen folks taking. But answer the question. But the question I had many years ago is why is there this gap? Why is there this confusion? And is there actually a gap in the way David Allen or the way the book describes contexts? And I'm going to argue tonight that there is a gap, that they went a certain distance, but then, or it went a certain distance, he went a certain distance, but then no further. And the no further part it was to explain why contexts work in general and how to devise your own. So he suggested a particular number of contexts, gave a hint as to how you could use them, but didn't explain exactly what to do when those contexts stop working. So why is it, why are we here in 2021? The book came out in 2001, and why is it taking so long to come up with some kind of answer? Well, there's been a lot of research since 2001, thankfully, that we're gonna pull from tonight, and some of it has to do with task and the definition of tasks, and the rest of it has to do with tags for data. So I did, a, I did some research on what tags 
for data, the history of tagging. And this is just data tagging. So this is going back to, you know, I, I, I was hearing terms I haven't heard for years, like Emacs, which was a text editor that used tags. Um, folks were, were, were talking about delicious, the old tagging system where you could tag items in the internet, a precursor to Google search, I believe. And this is a Wikipedia entry talking about the history of tagging. Really interesting. And I thought, I thought, I saw how far we've come in accepting what tags mean and the value of tagging. But here we're not just talking about tagging for generic data. We're going to be talking about tagging for tasks, which is its own thing. And because the, the research has not been really applied to the 2001 version of getting things done, folks have remained confused, frustrated, and second-guessing themselves. And, and that, that includes me. So today, my goal is to take a quantum leap, have us jump and build actually a future for ourselves based on a new understanding. So it's not just, this isn't just about a head game where some concepts are shared that you say, yeah, those are pretty cool. I'm actually interested in you changing your future behavior, actually taking steps that you otherwise wouldn't take. So before I go much further, let me see exactly where you are at right now. How much of a challenge are contexts and tasks? So let's answer that first question. If on a scale of one to five, where a five is a major challenge and one is no challenge at all, let me see if you're here just to enjoy a conversation or if you're here to solve some real problems. Let's see. So that's some threes. Thanks, Brad, Linda. Everyone's a three. Tanil's a five. Okay. One, David doesn't, David doesn't have a problem. He's good to go. Context two, tags four to five. Okay, good. Interesting. I'm actually going to say that those are actually the same thing, but we'll talk about that today. Dog of four. Yes. So I want to put, in some ways, put your minds at ease tonight, but also to provoke you to do some of this forward thinking that I'm going to be suggesting everyone needs to do, that you're not alone, that we all need to do this thinking. Um, and that includes me, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the thinking I think we all need to do. But let me ask you question number two. What is the single biggest question around context or tagging or tags? Just drop and get an idea of where your head is at. Tonight, January 28th, it is not October. It is not October. It's January. Marcel, how can I use contexts more effectively? Great. Who else? What's your single biggest question or concern? How much additional time will tags take me? Very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How can one use context of 2021 to help workflow? Yes, David, thank you. Let's get one more up at least. How can I get them to present the best next action or all of the tasks in my day? Yeah, because you get to that point in the day and you want to be able to execute the next best task from a list of perhaps 100, 200, 300, some of us. And being able to select the right next, best next task for you, which is not the best next task for someone else who could have the same exact same tasks, but be different from you. How do you choose the right ones? Great. All right. So we want to move from the state of being sort of fuzzy and going to clarity. And I hate to say I jumped all over the place when I did not have the distinctions I'm going to be sharing tonight. So in 1999, I used categories of tasks. I had categories. Then I learned about time blocking in 2001, started to use it. I thought it wasn't working, so I picked up context in 2006. Disaster. Went back to using time blocking in 2007. Really, I didn't have a schema as to why I needed to change and why something wasn't working. And 2015 upgraded the way I do time blocking, and I'll explain the change that I made in 2015 after the first um, edition of my book came out, after the first edition, which is why I had to write a second. All right, so here are some of the big, here for the three big secrets that I advertised. Here they are. So if they're not big enough, you may say, ah, I already know these and disappear. But I bet you to stay around because as I go into them, 
you may discover a thing or two that's at least provocative, if not new. So here's the first secret is that tags are not optional. And what do I mean by that? By the way, I have the words running along the transcript, running along the bottom of the screen, because not many of you, I don't think, are native Jamaican speakers, right? So I'm going to guess that when I start talking quickly, I'm going to lose a couple of people because I pronounce things a little bit differently. If that's the case, you can always stop me and ask, well, what does that word mean? And what did you mean when you said that? But that's the reason I'm running the transcript at the bottom. If you find that it's, it's not helpful, then just let me know. Okay, so let's start the, start the answer or the first secret. Why does everyone tag? So here's the, the, the theory. The theory is that a child develops a time-based productivity system right after they're taught the concept of time. And this happens around the ages seven or eight. Did a bunch of research and discovered this is the consensus. They don't teach themselves the concept of time. They have to be taught. And there are uncontacted tribes in the world today who don't have a concept of time in the way that we use time. They don't use clocks. And they have a very, very different, they, they actually, anyway, I wrote a whole paper on it, but I won't bore you with it tonight. But after they're taught the concept of time, typically they start creating their first tasks somewhere in the region of adolescence. Uh, they start to say, okay, I do this. I can't do it now. I'll do it later. So they start to pick up on the gap between creation and somewhere in their teens, they discover that keeping tasks alive is somehow important and having your tasks slip away is not cool because you want to fulfill your intentions. So they start to put in place personal habits and practices so that their intended tasks can actually get completed. So arguably this is showing, this is everyone Everyone in the, the, the developed world, developing world, everywhere in the world where clocks are used. This is exactly what the same process that we go through. There's no one study that will say exactly here's what these steps are, but there are a number of studies that we put together to say here's the conclusions of them. Okay, so David said the transcript is not showing at the bottom of the screen. Um, change. Or some, some can see it, some can't. Okay. Gotcha. Um, not sure about that, David. It's just below the, just below, just below the um, the diagram in black and in, in white print against the black background. Above the part where it asks you about where you see the buttons for raising your hand or exiting the room. Okay, so why is a personal system for tasks needed? Well, as teenagers, like I said, we figure out that there are three important moments that we need to take care of if we need to fulfill complex intentions. We need to create a task in the first moment. Some time passes. There is some retrieval. Of, and then there is the execution of the task to complete it. So when you're a very small child, five, six, seven, eight years old, you may have learned the concept of time. Perhaps your parents do the retrieval before you do the execution. But at some point, they get tired of that game and they say, you need to remember this. And they all talk about memory. You need to keep track of this. You need to track your own stuff. I can't do it for you. So you, the adolescent, the teenager, put in place a system to close the gap between moment one and moment two. And if you think you're any different, <laughs> well, let's see. All right, so guys, <laughs> I want you to put, uh, remember, what did you do when you were a teenager to fill the gap between moment one and moment two? What practices did you create? And people have the hardest time with this question because, I don't know, gray hair, and it just, Marcel says she, she started to write notes. And Neil says, you did a, it sounds like you did a kind of time, a day theming, Lee, uh, Neil. I tended to allocate a day. Yes. Anyone else? I've, I've stood in front of classes where I've just gotten crickets on this question. 
I wrote lists, create. It was a rubbish version of time blocking. Yeah, I did it. I, Neil, I did exactly the same thing. I had a study schedule. Everything went, oh, you had a planner. So there are some people who picked up planners at age 14, tended to be the high achievers, the ones who are going to be the head of the student council. The average teenager probably looked at people like us who had planners and they had something to say about me about us. Oh, Elizabeth says, my dad made me. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> great. So the fact is, this whole business of task creation is way more complex than the research indicates. The research barely, just barely scratches the surface. A task gets created in the mind, and this is true for all human beings, and it consists of attributes, some of which are subconscious. So this is a mental activity. And as we're speaking tonight, you're probably creating tasks and this activity is ongoing and doesn't stop and it continues in your sleep, okay? But let's, don't take my word for it, let's see. Let's pick, a, pick an example. So remember the milk, pretty easy example. So if you go to the kitchen tonight, go down to your fridge and Realize that the milk, you know, you do one of those things where you shake the box, shake the carton, and it's almost done. And you mentally create the task, right? Now, you may, you may know that the size, the cost, uh, uh, you may know, already know the, the size of the size and the cost. And you may already know what store you're going to pick it up from. But what other attributes does your mind automatically decide on when it creates that task. It's, it's there at the moment you say, I got to get more milk. What are some of the other attributes? Great. So Neil says, I envision the place I would be just before the store. I guess you're driving, like you're going from work to the store. So the place before, because you're looking to establish some proximity. Um, Janice put it on the list on the side of the fridge. But bef before you even do that, what are some of the attributes of the task itself before it makes its way onto the list? Before, Marcel, before it gets to the shopping list, it's actually right there. So you, Brett says he decides to tell the wife about the milk. Okay, so that's a decision that's made. So one of your attributes is delegation. <laughs> the delegate task of getting the milk. Relating it to other food items, great, because, for example, if you're going to get it at 7-Eleven, um, at you're going to think, oh, well, what else can I buy at 7-Eleven? So you start to associate it with other items that you can get at the same store. Great. What else do I need? Because I don't want to go to back to the store for the one thing. Right. So you start to broaden the need. Great. When do I need it back? Great. So, David, you have a time attribute, and that, that could lead to other kinds of, is it urgent? Is it uh, important? Can it wait till next week? All of these are automatically and quickly there before you even can even get to writing it down. We need more. I need to remember that. How can I remember it? Sorry, I just folded the screen. Yep. So the fact that there's a need, so there's a level of urgency or non-urgency. How to remember it, the, the technique to remember it. So the mind is moving really fast. And we're, what we're really trying to do here is just slow down the task creation process to understand that there is a dynamic that happens so quickly that we don't think about it. I think if I need it right now or if I can pick it up later. So you're thinking about a schedule, uh, Julie. Yeah, and so these are automatically always there. And I, I, if you read my book, Find I gave the example, and I think I came up with 20 different attributes. Because there's some that we haven't even mentioned, like, is it skim, or is it whole, or is it all the different kinds of milk? Um, who is the maker of it? Where is it made? Is it, um, I know they don't have, they don't have vegan milk. That's a, that's an oxymoron, right? But you could be, could it be, um, Non-violently harvested. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what the different kinds of milk are that are, you know, the ones that you would say that are more green than other kinds of milk, green milk versus regular milk. But 
they're automatically there the minute you commit and invest and your mind moves so quickly that it could easily come up with 20 or 30. So here's the innovation that GTD brought to our attention. GTD said, or getting things done said, take one attribute and elevate that one, focus on that one. And the context that were shared in the first version of GTD mostly had to do with physical proximity. For example, at home, at computer, at work, at store, at errands, at, you know, it, it was mostly about what do I physically need? Who or what do I physically need in order to execute this particular task? And that was the, 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 the thinking. Um, and mostly the reason given was David Allen said, that way, if you find yourself in a particular context, you can do other things that also belong to the same context. So I think I called it contingent productivity in a paper that I'll share with you by the end of the evening. The idea that you can um, basically scale up a bit, take advantage of the fact that you are already in a context to do others. In other words, take advantage. So great idea and work for many, many, many people. And then he added some other contexts such as waiting for and someday. And these don't follow the original prescription. And some confusion got en entered, which is that if contexts are for physical proximity and to be advantageous, take advantage of a location, what does waiting for have to do with that? What does someday have to do with that? That doesn't fit the original description. But obviously, people found that waiting for does work and someday it does work. So it doesn't fit. So when I go to add my context or a different context, what, what do I use? What rule do I use? It's not physical proximity. It, what, what exactly, what design principle should I apply? Okay, so to explain some of that, I need to sort of take a little bit of a diversion to our psychological objects. So there's a whole line of thinking championed by Kurt Danziger. He's, a, a, he's an academic. Um, I think he's still alive. But he, he's, he, he wrote a, a number of fascinating books. Just don't know the one. I can't remember the name. But one of his theses was that broken hearts are not like broken legs. So what does he mean by that? When you as an academic or anybody study broken legs, a broken leg in 2021 is the same as a broken leg in 2500 BC in that it's a physiological and physical occurrence. However, you take a, a, a word like pathos and the meaning that the Greeks gave to pathos does not have the meaning that it has today. Pathos is a psychological object. There's a range of psychological objects which cannot be studied in the way that objects are studied. And his thesis was that you get into trouble when you try to treat psychological objects like physical objects. Psychological objects have their own properties. So tasks, if there are, if there are psychological objects, also have their own properties. And one of the properties is that they have a whole number of attributes that get created at the same time the task is created. Okay, so what does that have to do with context and tags and what we're about? Well, here we go. There's two kinds of tags, perhaps. There are the implicit tags which are kept in your mind, some conscious, some subconscious. And then there are explicit tags. So contexts are uh, an example of explicit tags. Why? Because your system uses context in order to manage your tasks, right? So you've, you've elevated an implicit task to an explicit task at the behest of getting things done. And now you're managing your tasks using this particular tag. So the tag existed before you read the book. It, it was there. It, perhaps subconsciously, you might say, 
you already knew that you need to have physical items available to you in order to execute your tasks. So that was already a no-brainer. However, the, the, the breakthrough that David Allen recommended was to take that implicit task and elevate it, make it explicit, and then use it as a part of your task management system, leaving all of the other tags behind. So thankfully, this is a psychological object that we're talking about. You don't have to bring all these tags with it. You can leave them all wherever they were in your mind and just work with explicit tags. So here's an example, uh, back to remembering the milk. So in this particular case, um, this is perhaps one that David would, would suggest. The implicit tags all remain the same. They sit in your mind. And in David's case, he suggested that you figure out the time that you're gonna actually do the task. So you do perhaps some time blocking in order to pick up the milk. So you make that task, that tag explicit and all the others remain hidden. Interesting game, huh? You take the tags, you make them explicit, you use them and apparently it works. We wouldn't be here tonight <laughs> if, the, if this, this business didn't work. But when, when do you make a particular tag explicit? When, what, what, how do you decide? How do you choose? So let's talk about that. So you may agree at this point that I've made a point that, okay, Francis, I can buy secret number one. Tags are not optional. They are implicit. They already exist. If I really dug around, I could find 50 tags for just remembering the milk alone, the 50 attributes. And how do I decide which ones to use and when? Well, the answer is what I'm calling secret number two, which is that task volume rules. And let me explain what that means. So the reason that tags are useful is that they make something manageable. So a tag, for example, is like a handle on a bag. It allows you to manipulate the bag, right? Without the tag, it's kind of messy. Or without the the, the handle is kind of messy. And a tag is a handle on a bag. On a suitcase, for example, there's three kinds of tags on this particular suitcase. There's a handle that makes it physically manipulatable. There's there are some destination tags, for different parts of the world like Kyoto and Pisa, and I think the star is US and Italy. That's a second kind of tag that helps the, the bag to get to its destination. I guess this is what they did back in the old time days. They had they slapped it on the side of the suitcase. And then the third kind of tag is the address tag, just hanging off there from the handle. If their bag gets lost, then it goes back to that address. So these are three different ways of tagging the same suitcase. So. Why not use all of them? Hey, three isn't bad. Why not use as many tags as you can think of? If you can use 50, make them all explicit because, hey, what? This is the internet age. This is infamous. We have powerful computers in our palms. Our phones are amazing. Why not just do it that way? I hear I want some answers from you guys. Why not use as many tags as you can think of? in your time management system. Neil says, messy. Yep, they lose integrity, confusing, creates more confusion. Because, but, but guys, I have a computer that can manage, could manage a hundred tags. It, it has the power, the power is in the device. Where do you stop? It'll make it way too complex and burdensome. The next best action needs to work on clarity. Yeah, so the, having a whole bunch of tags may be computationally possible, but that's not the problem. It's then the problem is that you gotta choose and you gotta choose wisely. So what do I mean by that? Tell me if you've heard of this book, please in the chat. It's the book by Eli Goldratt. Yes. Okay, one person. 
trained in my uh thank you uh, neil me too yep great paul read it it's a fantastic book so it talks about bottlenecks it, this may sound like what the heck does that have to do with where we are tonight well one of the ba major breakthroughs in the story the goal it's, it's written as a novel um is that they, the protagonist discovers that the bottleneck in a company in a manufacturing facility moves around it changes location when you change the configuration of the factory the bottleneck changes you change the throughput of the factory the bottleneck moves as well anything changes and moves it away from a steady state then the bottleneck actually moves around so the, the choke point in order to get out as much widgets as possible tends to change now it doesn't change randomly is actually a science to it but what if we could steal from the science that he brought into being with respect to factory and throughput and think about ourselves as little factories and the throughput being our tasks so what's to stop us from managing 50 different tags well there's a bottleneck and we are it or ability to manipulate more than one tag consider that to be your bottleneck so here's the first principle and i don't think you're going to find any any scientific papers written on this because i've been searching for a long time to find folks who are interested in this particular topic at this level of detail not found it but here's the principle I've come up with, which is that you use as few tags as possible and prefer only one. Now, intuitively, I think you guys already know that having, given that you're here in a webinar like this one, you've already thought that far and said, yeah, I, I a bunch of, obviously that doesn't work. What's the minimum you can get away with is a better question. And I'm gonna propose that the minimum you can get away with should be as close to one as possible. All right, what, is the, what does that mean? Well, before I get into that, here's the principle that makes the first one make a little bit of sense. You choose the tag which helps you optimize your scarcest resource. So of all the infinite number of tags you could choose or types of tags you could choose, I'm gonna suggest there's actually a hidden mechanism that our psychology limits us to following. And at each point along the way, the best choice for us to make is to choose the one that allows us to optimize whatever scarcest resource we're experiencing at the moment. Ooh, that might sound like, what is he talking about? Let me try to explain it in just really plain terms. So when you were a preteen, all of your tag tasks were managed memory right they were all implicitly you were implicitly tagging and you didn't know what that meant you were just remembering stuff so you remembered a lot of it you didn't but your memory was you know and your parents said you got to remember to do these things and you're like yeah i'll try i'll try i'll try so this little girl one day she gets to the point where she tries to manage too many tasks using her memory and all of a sudden she starts to forget stuff in other words you know, she really wanted to call her friend that evening and then thought she would remember and then she forgot. She got to school the next day. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. And she realized that she's not so good at closing the gap between moment one and moment two that I mentioned, between the creation of a task and the retrieval of that task. She's not very good at it. Why? Because she's now trying to remember more than just one or two things. So when she was really young, she had one thing to remember each night. And her when she got home, her mom said, What's the one thing you need to remember? She said, my homework. She had one thing to remember each day. Life was wonderful. And then it got more complex. And then she had more things. And then she has an epiphany after spending time with her cousins. Or she walks into getting, she picks up getting things done, <laughs> for example. But she has an epiphany in this case. Let's say with her cousins. And her, she sees her cousins who are a bit older doing things a bit differently. And she finds a way. Oh, they're writing stuff down. She actually finds a way of 
managing past her bottleneck of using her memory. She goes to using a totally different way of managing her tasks. So the bottleneck was her memory. She hit the ceiling of what her memory could manage. It started to create problems and errors and unwanted symptoms. So she then needed to move to an entirely different way of managing her tasks, which would allow her to now manage more tasks effectively. So this isn't a, a very different story than you may have heard from studying with David Allen, because essentially the story he tells, I'm just telling it from a slightly different angle. So she picks up a task list. She gives up using memory to some degree. She goes on using a particular task list and she has a task, one list of all of her tasks. And then she picks up, maybe she picks up, picks up getting things done and getting things done says, no, don't use memory. Don't use a single task list. Use a sorted task list and use context as your tag. And she goes, oh, that works and it works until it doesn't work. Why? Well, like every other human being in the world, what we do when we discover that something works around task management is that we try to manage more tasks. And so far, we've learned that you add more tasks, you add more tasks until you hit a bottleneck. And then you've got to switch the way you manage your tasks. So at this point, she's already gone through two switches. She may not remember recognize that she did, but it happened all the same. And she makes another switch. And she goes from using contexts or physical location-based tasks to using temporal tags, time-based tasks, tags, sorry. But the underlying mechanism is exactly the same, right? You manage a certain number of ta tasks using what you have. You hit a limit, a bottleneck. The only way past the bottleneck is not to try harder. It's actually to change your approach because our psychology sort of leads us to make these changes, the four changes that I've just described. And the benefit that, that getting things done gave us is that it defined what in this diagram anyway is a, is a third step. So getting things done sweet spot was right with respect to helping people move from memory or single unsorted lists to a sorted list. And that was a huge benefit. However, at the same time, it also said a few other things about temporal tagging. So this is very similar to my, you might say, I, I use the analogy a lot of moving, moving the earth, moving earth. You know, a friend gives you a call and says, listen, I'm, I need to move some dirt tomorrow. Can you bring, come tomorrow. And they hang up. And then you're left wondering, I know I'm going to move some dirt tomorrow, but what do I bring? Do I back up my truck, which I happen to have, I own a construction firm, I guess, because we're moving, we're moving a piece of a mountain, or do I bring my trowel so that we can repot some plants? So different tools are applied for different, necessary for different volumes of dirt. So I suggest that different tools task management are suitable for different volumes of tasks. But there's a catch. So if there's anything true to what I'm saying, there is a huge catch to this. And this is like the bad news. And this is why I jumped around the way I did in the 90s and 2000s and couldn't figure out where to settle down and what to do. It's because the symptoms of your task management system hitting the ceiling or its bottleneck are exactly the same regardless of the system you use. And that's what caused me to go back to what I had done before. 
Because if you remember, for example, that context really worked for you back in 2002 when you picked up the book, then you may think that if you have the symptoms today, like symptoms that everyone experiences when they can't manage the volume of tasks, that you've got to go back to 2001 and reapply canonical GTD because your memory is that that's what worked. Okay? That, that's what you needed. So here's the common symptoms. As you go through that list, you can see that's, just, that's no special list. It's exactly the same set that come up when you're using memory, a single task list, a sorted task list, a la GTD, or temporal tags. By the way, tempor temporal tags are due dates, duration, start times, anything to do with your calendar. So, my argument is that task volume rules, but let me take some questions now around this whole notion that task volume rules. Because it, it's not a popular uh, observation and arguably in line with David Allen's suggestions with, for everything except time blocking and temporal tagging. Any questions? For what I've said so far. I may be talking to the believers at this point. I'm not sure. <laughs> In which case, it's like, <laughs> this is like church. Is the time available context in GT what you're talking about? I'm, I'm beyond talking about context in GTD, um, Linda. The best way to think of this is actually not to think of context at all due to the confusion I mentioned before. But just think of tags at this point. Just think of context being one particular kind of tag, but you've got to figure out what tags to use for you. Uh, Tenniel understands why there is a bottleneck, and this bottleneck, arguably, is inescapable. The, the things I'm arguing or describing here are things that you just cannot escape as a human being, given the limitations of our psychological makeup. When you're manipulating psychological objects, they tend to behave in a particular way. You know, a broken leg doesn't go away because you forget, but a task certainly will. Okay, so let's talk about the plans that I'm interested in you. So if you're already a GTD user, so you know, David, David, David is a big advocate of using temporal tags or time blocking. Many GTD users are struggling because there are ways in which I'll share in a minute, getting things done, say, don't do that. And as their task volume increases, the hidden dynamic sort of driving them is how do I have less errors, even though I'm looking into the future and all I can see is more tasks and more tasks and more tasks. Going back to canonical GTD 2001 doesn't work, but what do I do exactly? So GTD actually has some built-in issues with respect to the way temporal tagging is described and time blocking. The original, original 2001 issue talked about context and taking advantage of being in a context in order to execute certain tasks, right? That you could, like I said, if you're at 7-Eleven, there's other things that you could buy as well, other tasks you could execute because you're in that context. So I, I think I call that contingent productivity. What it doesn't have productivity, which is a detailed description of how to, what context should you be in tomorrow? Should you be in one context? Five, 10? Should you transition from two contexts to three other ones? GTD is silent on it, and there's a, a paragraph in the book where it says that that's handled by other systems like Gantt chart planning, and David Allen says, essentially, I'm not going to talk about that. You guys figure that out. So it doesn't say anything about how, which context to be in. It just says when you're in that context, benefit in the following way. But there's also a bit more. So... I wrote an article, and I, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask Dale to drop the, my wife to drop the link 
in the chat, but it's on the Schedule U website. And the article I wrote is called Why David Allen Seems to be Changing His Mind About Scheduling. And what I do is I trace the, the progress that he made from essentially saying that there's only three things that go in your calendar. And he says that you needed to only put time-specific actions, day-specific actions, and day-specific information and, and, and adhere to a, a, a hard landscape of activity. In other words, activities that involve other people for the most part. Activities that are really, you can't change that aren't discretionary or optional. Things that you gotta do at a particular time. Like for example, you have to go to the 7-Eleven. If it closes at six, you leave work at five, you have to go between five and six, you don't have a choice. Okay, so that was his original, original statement. But over time, as you probably know, is that his thinking changed, right? So here's, here's one example of where his thinking evolved and changed. Uh, basically, he says at the end of it, block away. If that's what works for you, block away. Between 2001 and 2016, his message changed. It evolved. And that makes sense because our relationship to tax tagging now in 2021 is very different than it was back in 2001. So it only makes sense that he would change and evolve with the times. He hasn't gone back to say all that I'm trying to say tonight, but he said, I observe that it works and you should, you should use it. So what do I mean by temporal tagging exactly? There's two kinds that I have identified. And we go into great detail with the, uh, about the two of them at Schedule U. And this is the transition that I invite you to make if you are using sorted lists a la GTD and maybe thinking of time blocking or haven't started time blocking, is that as you added more tasks and you added more than 168 hours of tasks per week, the new bottleneck went from being the availability of physical resources to the availability of hours, just time. And that now the allocation of tasks in your calendar now becomes the new bottleneck. And there's two ways that I know of to do to do this. One is to time block manually so that you have a, a digital calendar, preferably, and you move the blocks around by hand, basically drag and drop. And there's some really cool apps that help you and show you how to do that. And that's what I was doing between 2001 2006. And then I went back to using context. And then I came back again to resuming manual scheduling between 2006 or seven and 2015, wrote my book, first edition came out, two months later, someone called me up and says, I found something new, it's awesome. And what she found was auto scheduling. And what uh, Melody, <laughs> Melody, my good friend, introduced me to was Skedpa, uh, a program that can automatically, basically you train it to rejigger your calendar the way you would train someone who is an administrative assistant to do your work for you, that particular job for you. And those are the two ways of doing, uh, doing temporal tagging. Either you do it manually or you hire a tool like Skenpal, um, uh, Sorted3, um, there's about nine of them out now, right now. All of them use AI. And as you can tell, I'm a fan of them because they do, they take what used to take me hours to do, and they, you know, in a second, they, they do them and produce an optimal schedule. But tonight's not a night to, to go into the details of that per se. It's to understand that there's this transition and it always occurs when there's a bottleneck and you hit up against the limits of what your new task volume will allow itself to be managed by. It sounds really clunky, but your task volume deserves a particular kind of tool. And it's perfectly fine to use memory if you only have one task per night to remember, because it's doable. However, the, the problem that we have is where these overlaps occur and where those symptoms show up that I talked about before. 
and then okay let's do a little brainstorming guys and we're almost formal part of the evening so i've argued that memory then single unsorted list then sorted list then temporal tags so there will come a time when temporal tags do what they're supposed to do you use them very 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 well and there will be a new bottleneck what do you think that bottleneck will be i do not have an answer i'm not going to pretend like i have i know this but i want to hear from you buying the argument these are all temporary solutions that fit a particular task volume what's going to replace temporal tagging as the brand new way to manage your tasks or tag your tasks let's get some ideas up in the chat learning to say no <laughs> okay <laughs> arguably that's a part of some temporal tagging right oh but no no that's true okay i could see i could see i could see what paul is saying because your calendar says no doesn't mean that you say no <laughs> okay that's a those are two different phenomena two different behaviors great who else <laughs> So some way of ensuring that you're scheduling the right thing. Right. Okay. So I could imagine, I could imagine that. Um, some, some have argued that energy tells you what you, the right thing is. But, and, and what the auto schedulers are trying to do is to try to tell you the right thing using a number of criteria, but certainly not energy and certainly not motivation or contribution contribution to long-term planning or same with your goals none of those that the, the ones that exist they're they're pretty i won't say dumb but they're robots they're robots who do something in a particular way and they do that one thing really well but someone else the task is quadrant two of the uh, uh, copy matrix important not urgent if it could tell you that, yeah, if, if, if we could know that something is, and, and the problem with importance is that importance changes, so does urgency. So some kind of dynamic tool that scans your tasks and perhaps tells you what's important and what's next so that, you, yes, you have the time for it, but it also indicates that this is, based on my computations, this is the most important. Obviously, there's no, no software that can do that right now. You, right, so you could end up executing a whole bunch of small tasks and totally miss the life-changing ones. I have a whole bunch of clients because of the work we do in strategic planning in my company. And as we ask them what they've been engaged in for the last few years, this last year was respect because most companies were focused on just really scrabbling, scrambling through, basically getting through the basics and surviving, not in the long term direction that they were in. So most of the tasks they were focused on are, do we get the masks to the right people? Are we giving people enough time away from work so they don't catch the disease? So they were dragged into really small tasks. And there's a few who made strategic decisions and are moving ahead like lightning speed. So there are companies that are, are succeeding in COVID. So if there's a if there were, if there's a tool to tell you that you're doing way too many small tasks and not enough strategic tasks, I love that one. I, I'm, this is great. Things that match my priorities instead of others' priorities. Okay, great, great. There's something that could really tune in, read the connection and tell you. Um, an app that would have to be on a diet so I don't have to be. <laughs> Brett? Not sure if that'll ever happen, but we'll see. <laughs> Most initial bo bottlenecks are as old as time with always in existence. It's like meal planning, says Julie. You can have the ingredients arrive for the right day, do all the prep, but not have the appetite for that meal come Thursday night. We can schedule the task to make sure nothing is forgotten, but we still want to do it. Have to want to do it. Time and task can be planned, but humans are not robots and often turn away from what they thought 
and must do because they don't want to. So if there were a tool that could somehow interact with your motivation, because we do this for each other, right? So, you know, my wife can want to have any meal she wants me to have, right? By our conversations, I might not feel for something by the time we've had the conversation, I want to have it, right? So there's a human being who can do that for you, but is there software? I would, I, 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 I imagine that we long for that kind of help. Again, it's the kind of help that a good administrative assistant could provide you. Because really what we're doing is we're replacing the higher functioning of an administrative assistant. I like some time blocks, but creating other time blocks for quadrant two activities. Yeah, um, Paul, if you check out um, Neil Fiore's book on the unschedule, so he talks about coming at it from the opposite direction, which is basically you lay out an entire schedule for all 168 hours and you start with sleep and you work your way back to get to discretionary time. And I think what you're focusing on is the time blocking of discretionary time. But the process is an interesting one. Um, it's basically the one I use where you define time. And but anyway, it's a, it's a different way of doing it. Um, time is usually the motivation for me. Uh -huh. May not be the way I want, but no longer be genuinely appropriate to do or possible. Yep. And to have some kind of interaction, socially declared goal type apps. Yeah, right. There is Neil, right? And that's, that's shown, psychologists have shown that those have a huge benefit. There's a software called whew, Age. I can't remember the name of it. Um, anyway, the software allows you to make public monetary bets that you'll complete a particular task in a particular time frame. Oof, can't remember the name. But anyway, that public setting and the money actually helps. Great, okay, thanks. Thanks for your contributions, Julie. All right, so let's move on. We have a few slides left. Okay, so here's the, the, the question of the day. Where are you at? So if you're already at the, the edge of task management and you're already using auto schedulers, there's not much I can point you to that's definitive. You're right on the edge. But if you're not, if you're anywhere else, what are you using today? Are you anywhere at the limit? So if you're not at the limit, don't change. And as I said, if you're a, a, ten, a 10 year old or eight year old with one task per day, don't change. However, if you're experiencing unwanted symptoms because your task volume has increased, then what's your plan for migrating from where you are now? Basically, I'm asking you to enter into a change management activity. I am now to where I want to be. And as you look to the future, is your task volume likely to increase? Is it likely to go up? Okay. And if it is, What's the nature of the system that you want to evolve to next? And what's the time frame? In my trainings, I actually ask people to think about the time frame. Think about two major, major aspects of it. What apps you want to implement and what um, behaviors you want to change. Because at the higher levels, everything above memory, you've got to be thinking of where is this app? What's the device? Is it a piece of paper? Is it a book? Is it a planner? Is it a smart app on a smartphone? Is it a, a piece of software? The interplay between the behavior and the app are what you have to decide in terms of your destination and changing from where you are now. Again, if you're not experiencing unwanted symptoms, you shouldn't change. Okay. All right. So these are the questions I actually want us to engage in. Um, we'll be going to the networking session. So here's here's a, a few more resources if you're interested in digging in a little bit more deeply into what uh, we've done tonight. So there will be a replay. If you go to the, if you go now, obviously there will be no replay, right? Right, great. However, if you go, if you go there on Saturday, you'll see a link to a replay. All right, and you'll be able to download the the, the video and watch it at your leisure. But I also wrote a paper that was the basis for this uh, talk. It goes into some other aspects. 
it's available at the URL that I have before, and there's also a bit.ly URL just at the bottom of the screen. Um, let's see if we can, can we drop that, drop that um, link in the chat? Uh, SchedulU.org slash do you need new GTD context? And if you're interested in the science, so you're not going to find, you're not going to find a, a, a academic paper that someone has written that says here are here's the, the the relationship between task volume and and app and behavior choices among professionals with overloaded. You're not going to find that. You'll find bits and pieces. But the good news is that I've put all the bits and pieces. I've embedded them in the 240 or 200 and something references in the back of my book. I wanted to leave a bit of a trail so that you can go back and figure out all of the background to as far as I've gotten. And you can tell where, you'll be able to tell where I stopped, where I couldn't find any more research and I inferred a number of things based on, on other bits of information I could find. So I wanna invite you to register for the Time Blocking Virtual Summit, which is coming up in March. I heard this is, you already got that particular link. Um, and Dale, if you could drop the link to the book, theperfect.mytimedesign.com in the chat. And let me take a couple questions and I'll tell you what's gonna happen once you've asked the questions. We're gonna go into networking mode. Thought I had a slide for that. And in networking mode, we're gonna come back in and answer these questions. So we're gonna be chatting with each other at private tables, answering these questions. And I wanna give you an opportunity to really, if you wanna come, I'll be there. Um, but the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna actually close this down and restart another room so that we can have a fresh networking session. And you'll find yourself at one of the tables uh, and you can move from table to table by double clicking to a different table and using your video and your audio to chat with a private group. So let me see if there's any other questions. We have about four minutes before I close this room and open up the networking session. Once again, it's the same link. Okay, questions. Neil, looking forward to networking. Great, great. Other questions based on what you've heard me say tonight? I know I could not have answered all the questions. Ducalis. I don't have no, is that a car? <laughs> I know it's not. <laughs> I've not, I've never heard of Ducalis. <laughs> uh, I think Ducati is the name of the, Bugatti, Ducati is the name of the car. No, Ducalis. Do you have a link you could share, Neil? Go ahead and drop it in the, in the chat if you have the link. No, answer that, I've never heard of it. But let's take other questions. Helps you rate your time. Whoa. Yeah, okay, great. That Yes, I'm, as you can imagine, I'm definitely interested in that. Janice, great, thanks for coming. All the best. Other questions, comments? Guys, there's no way I've, I don't answer every, every single thing there is to answer on, on the topic. There's no way. Just drop me any other questions that you have for the general group. And if not, you can find me in the networking session and ask me questions one-on-one -on -one if you're shy, although I probably shouldn't have said that, right? You know, everybody's going to hold their questions. Can't stay for the networking session. All right, sorry, just you go. Thanks for coming, Paul. Thanks for coming, SD. Someone put a question on the Q&A tab. Oh, yeah, okay, someone did. Great. Regarding memory, unsorted list, sorted list, temporal tagging. At what stage is prioritization? Great question, Tor, Tor, Tor Grimm. Right. Okay, so essentially what I'm saying is that the prioritization, the best prioritization that you can do at each stage is to maximize the use of whatever resource you are, you have in scarce supply. So if you're time, time temporal tagging, the scarce resource is time. And the, the, the first prioritization, the most important one is what do I have time to do? So the most important activity here in that realm is coming up with an optimized calendar and choosing between the items in that calendar. 
you're using sorted lists, then it's what context, for example, if you want to use that particular tag. What context is the one that I should be in? And you decide what context to be in and how to capitalize on that. If you use uh, another way of sorting your lists, then you may use importance or urgent, urgency. Those are other ways of tagging items in lists. So there you're using those particular attributes. If you're using a unsorted list, um, the scarce resources, the length of the list, um, so basically what people tend to do because the list is shorter is they just rescan and rescan and see whatever it is is on the list that's important. It's not a big problem for them because their lists tend to be short. They tend to migrate upstream when their lists become too long. And then memory, memory is the worst of all. What do you use to prioritize if you're using memory? I don't have a recommendation for that because I don't think there is any way of doing it. Okay, so this is going to close in two minutes time. Let's come back into networking mode. I'm going to shut down here. Come grab me. I'll see you at a table. See, thanks for coming if you've had to leave. And let's pick it up back in just a minute.